Hi there. In this uh, short A2 micro revision video, we're going to take a few minutes to think about uh, imperfect competition. So imperfect competition is any market structure which deviates from the strict assumptions of perfect competition. In other words, it's virtually every market you can ever encounter. London Underground, for example, an example of a near pure monopoly, although of course there's, there's competition in different forms of transport. The supermarkets in the UK are essentially a working monopoly. Tesco is the dominant firm, but also an oligopoly. Uh, the five firms that dominate the market and the rise of the deep discounters. Uh, coffee shops such as Costa, well essentially a contestable oligopoly. Costa is the, by far the biggest coffee retailer in the UK, but there are many competing brands. Pepsi and Coca-Cola, a good example of IPIP competition, they're essentially dominant firms in the duopolistic market in certain countries. Uh, monopolistic competition is uh, typically associated with relatively small firms, many competing against each other watch repairers, sandwich shops, hairdressing salons, etc. are good examples of that. And I suppose the smartphone is a really good example of an oligopoly, but a contestable one. You have the dominant firms such as Samsung and Apple, but increasingly emerging companies, particularly from China, providing significant competition. But these are all examples of imperfect competition. And here's a good example of a dominant firm in the US market for chewing gum. Wrigley's has nearly 60% 60, 60 of the market. Now, clearly there's some other big players, but Wrigley is far ahead of the game. And if you define the market narrowly as the market for energy drinks in the United States, then again, we have a duopoly here dominated by Red Bull and Monster Beverage. So these are good examples of imperfect competition. Now, there are many different market structures which come under the umbrella term imperfect competition. <clears throat> Let's do a quick overview of three of them. Monopoly, oligopoly and monopolistic competition. So, in a monopoly, the number of firms will depend. In a pure monopoly, there's one, but a working monopoly is any firm with more than 25% of the market, and a dominant monopoly, any firm with more than 40%. Products tend to be branded, often patented, and there are assumed to be significant barriers to entry, especially structural entry barriers associated with a natural monopoly. Monopolies have pricing power, so pricing power is high, but that's limited by both the level of demand and also the elasticity of demand. A monopoly can choose the price or the output, but they can't choose both. And we expect in a monopoly to see super normal returns, price greater than average cost, in the long run. Again, because of barriers to entry. In an oligopoly, it's a market dominated by a few sellers. There may be many, many more, uh, but uh, a few firms dominate. The C5 concentration ratio is assumed to be more than 60%. Products are branded, that's really quite important. And then there are barriers to entry, particularly protecting the market power of established firms who have managed to scale their production. Pricing power is strong in oligopoly, but interdependent. Firms in oligopoly have to consider the likely reaction of the competing firms in the market. But profits are expected to be high, of course, because of barriers to entry. In monopolistic competition, there are many competing sellers each producing a slightly differentiated product. And that means, of course, that each business in this market structure has a downward slope in demand curve. We assume in this market structure that entry barriers are low because of ease of entry and exit in the long run. Firms have some pricing power, but the plethora of competition and the, widen and the large number of close substitutes tends to make demand quite price elastic or price sensitive. And this limits the ability of firms to make high profits. Indeed, the absence of entry barriers means that supernormal profits in this market are assumed to be competed away by the entry of new products into the market. Here's the classic monopoly diagram showing a downward sloping average revenue curve and marginal revenue. And if we assume a monopolist aims to maximise profits, they are price at P1 with a unit cost of C1 and make a substantial supernormal return. In the long run, in monopolistic competition, although supernormal profits are available in the short term, the entry of new products is assumed to compete away those supernormal returns until we reach an equilibrium where there's a tangency at the profit maximizing output Q2. And there's a tangency between AR and AC. So price P2, the price equals average cost, only normal profits are being made. There are many different models of oligopoly in imperfect competition, one of which is the king to man curve model, illustrated here. 
The kink demand curve uh, follows because we assume that there's a varying reaction to rival firms to a price change for this business. We're assuming that other firms will follow if prices are cut, hence demand becomes inelastic, but the firms will not follow if prices rise because they aim to increase their market share and that makes demand more elastic. Now one of the predictions of this model is that prices tend to be anchored or sticky for a period of time at a certain level even if there's a change in marginal costs as shown here and that in imperfectly competitive uh, oligopoly markets non-price competition becomes a hugely important salient feature of competition between businesses. What about imperfect competition and different types of economic efficiency? Allocative productive dynamic. While in monopoly the price is greater than the marginal cost so there's a clear loss of allocative efficiency and a deadweight loss of consumer welfare. There's also a risk of X inefficiency on the cost side due to the lack of competition. The absence of intense competition may allow monopolists to allow their costs to drift higher. However, monopoly can still be regulated. Uh, if you think that monopoly profits are too high, you can impose a windfall tax on their profits. Or, as in the case of, for example, the payday loans companies or mobile phone roaming charges, the price that's charged can be capped by the competition authorities. In oligopoly, we tend to see low allocative efficiency, again, because price is greater than marginal cost. But there are lots of uh, big firms in these industries, or dominate, dominated by large firms. So scale economies are likely, which helps productive efficiency. And also the supernormal profits might spur the, the funding of research and innovation, because this is absolutely crucial in oligopolistic markets. So dynamic efficiency might well be encouraged. However, there's a risk of price collusion, which can damage consumer welfare uh, because it keeps prices higher than they, they would otherwise be. In monopolistic competition, allocative efficiency is high. Price is quite close to marginal cost, although that does depend on the strength of market contestability. If firms think there's a genuine chance of new products coming in, then they may well price close to the competitive level. Uh, the, the high level of closed substitutes helps to keep prices competitive com for consumers, which is good for allocative efficiency. But from a productive efficiency point of view, uh, the fact there are so many products in the market might lead to the reduction in the use of economies of scale because the market has become saturated with many, many similar products. A word finally on monopoly versus contestable markets. So contestable markets operate in imperfect competition. As we've seen in the monopoly, there can be uh, any number of firms ranging from one to just a few, a working or dominant monopoly. And in the contestable market, any number of firms is possible. It's usually many, but it doesn't have to be. The barriers to entry are high in monopoly, but assumed to be low in a contestable market. In particular, a market is contestable if there are low or insignificant sunk costs, exit costs from leaving the market. Supernormal, supernormal profits are high in monopoly in both the short and the long run, but in contestable markets, the threat of entry, if firms are pricing inefficiently, limits profitability because of the risk of hit and run entry. Pricing power is high in monopoly, although it may be limited by regulation, and in a contestable market, pricing power is affected not just by actual competition, but crucially the threat of potential competition in the market. We've talked about efficiency already with monopoly, a word on efficiency in a contestable market. In theory, a highly contestable market should help move the market closer to allocatively efficient outcomes, although the, the lack of profit may hamper dynamic efficiency. Innovation is potentially strong in monopoly, although the absence of comp competition may be a barrier, but certainly in contestable markets, innovation is likely to be particularly strong, especially if we factor in the large number of disruptive technologies, particularly arising from e-commerce, which are affecting markets at the moment. So this has been a quick fire whiz through imperfect competition, markets which deviate from the strict assumptions of perfect competition.